Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Meet the Pioneers of Nutrition and Food Science session. It is part of the Sustainability Pioneers series that showcases entrepreneurs and innovators tackling today's major challenges to achieve the sustainable development goals. One of these many challenges uh, centers around our food system and food security. This topic could not be more timely, not least because today marks the start of the UN Food System Summit, only the sixth to be ever held uh, and the first to have its agenda shaped directly by an officially appointed scientific group. Obesity, malnutrition and antibiotic resistance as a result of intensive farming are all threats to the health of economies and societies um, in the years to come. Um, how can the latest insights from biology, agriculture and nutrition science be turned into practical approaches to protect people's lives and to ensure their health and well-being? I am Magdalena Skipper, Editor-in-Chief of Nature, a weekly science journal, and I am particularly excited to be moderating this session as Nature has been proud to support, vet and disseminate so much of the original research into the food system. With me to discuss these burning issues, I have um, Dr. Lamis uh, Jama, who is a tenured asso associate professor at the Department of Nutrition and Food Science at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. Uh, her other affiliations include the North Carolina Central University and Pennsylvania State University in the US. Her work centers around the interlinkages between uh, food security, migration and health. And her main interests include uh, the assessment of food and nutrition security status of vulnerable population groups. Uh, welcome, uh, Lamis. Uh, we also have here uh, Dr. Jennifer Ronholm, who is Assistant Professor at McGill University in Canada. And her interests are primarily in understanding the role of the microbiome in determining susceptibility of individuals, both humans and agricultural animals, to infection. Um, uh, welcome, uh, Jennifer. Before we start the conversation uh, as part of this uh, session, I wanted to engage with you who are listening uh, to us here uh, with a question, a question to which we will return at the end. I would um, like you to, so you will see a, a link in the chat, which I think has just been uh, posted there. Um, you will see a link to a, a question, which is uh, which of the uh, following would persuade you most effectively to change your diet? Um, is it um, ability to hold, to hold biodiversity loss, uh, reducing your carbon footprint, is it reducing antimicrobial resistance uh, or animal welfare uh, or indeed uh, improving your own health? So I can see you are voting already. I'll give you one sense, one, one second to, um, uh, to make your vote. Uh, animal welfare is leading. Oh, there are some changes. So what seems to be emerging most strongly at the moment is reducing the carbon footprint and animal welfare. Um, although improving your own health is coming in as well. I was just going to make a comment that we have very altruistic uh, audience with us, but that's of course uh, very important. So this is great. If I can ask you to remember how you voted in response to that question, because we will come back to this question at the end of our, our session. So let me now um, throw an opening question to, to both of you. Um, our food system is broken is a statement of fact that we hear from science and political leaders. And uh, a key problem is indeed intensive food production practice. Are we thinking creatively enough about how to reimagine food production? What is your bold idea or initiative that you believe we should be embracing? If I can turn to Lamise first. 
Sure. Thank you, Magdalena, uh, for the introduction, and thank you for starting with this very important question. Uh, the statement that you've said cannot come any true, um, especially post the COVID-19 pandemic and what the world has been undergoing. Uh, but I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned even before the pandemic and afterwards. We're trying to understand why is our food system broken. If I were to just present briefly and in one statement, Globally, the world is not on track on meeting and achieving, unfortunately, any of the nutrition indicators that we have set for ourselves. And that includes all malnutrition indicators that we discussed, be it from the undernutrition and hunger, food insecurity, micronutrient deficiencies, and overweight and obesity. And that is where we say this is where the food system has been heavily focused for years on feeding people. And as important as that is, and as important as the development that we've seen in that, in that perspective, what we should be thinking about is, of course, the nourishing of the human body and to ensure that we can do that sustainably. And today, with the initiation of the UN Food Summit and all the preparation meetings before, the discussion is how can we transform our food systems? Uh, there are room for change. It is a very complex system, and it does interact actually with other systems. It, it interacts with the health system, it interacts with the agri-food, and with so many other systems that we have to take into play. Uh, and there are ways to intervene at many levels, and there are trade-offs to be made. And I'm happy to discuss further what kind of innovative ideas are out there being tested in multiple contexts, because we cannot assume that the, that the world has to have the same answers or solutions across the board. There are context-specific solutions, be it for higher income countries or lower to middle income countries. And definitely there's no one size fits all. And I think today in the summit at the World Economic Forum and at the UN Food Summit and Food Systems Summit, the conversation is along. People's voice must be heard and there are ways to get about this. It's a challenge that we are all addressing and we should do it now. We cannot wait any longer. Thank you. Thank you for this very, very important. A number of, of strong themes emerging. And of course, you alluded to the fact that the Food System Summit has a subtitle of, of People's Summit as, as well. And the fact that we cannot wait any longer. But you also uh, pointed out, of course, that no one size solution would fit all problems in, in all contexts. And then um, also importantly, um, uh, th the fact that there is that interlinkage of um, a number of systems and, and solving uh, or offering solutions to, to the food system has to be done in, in a context. Thank you for this and we look forward to coming back to some specific examples that you promised us. But uh, Jennifer, what about um, uh, your ideas of you know where should we be looking to reimagining food system food production better? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, so I'm primarily an infectious disease person and how infectious disease interacts with our food systems. And there are some bigger cracks in this system that are getting bigger every year. And one, we know how to fix a lot of them, but they're complicated problems that deserve, that need massive change to fix them if we're going to go with the ways we know about change is very difficult. It requires economic, political will, and we don't always have that. Um, so one example that I'm going to bring up is the Salinas Valley in North America. We produce a lot of our food there. We produce a lot of our beef and our lettuce there. Um, the beef is beside the lettuce, and this is leading to massive outbreaks of salmonella and E. coli throughout uh, North America. We could move the beef or we could move the lettuce, but both of these are very complicated politically and economically. So my idea is, can we separate the disease transmission of from the beef to the lettuce and be creative in that way um, through modifying the microbiome of these environments and solve the problem other than these big complicated solutions? Um, but it is something that's affecting all of us and that we do have to move on. Really, really interesting. And the, the potential solution of, of what you draw attention to, this link between food production, the way food production is done and infection, 
it, it's a link which is not often talked about, is, is often underappreciated. So I think that's very important that you point this out. And um, I'm sure we, we will be talking more about the microbiome because I know that um, lies at the core of your research. But before we move further, could you briefly remind us what, we, what you mean, what we mean by uh, the microbiome? Sure. Um, so there's a community of microbes, bacteria, viruses, um, parasites that live in and on us, in our bodies, on our skins. Um, but this community also exists in animals, in their bodies, on their skin, in their mammary glands. And these uh, microbial communities are very important for our health and for the health of agricultural animals and for the health of environments, for that matter. That's great. Thank you. And um, of course, indeed, it's good to remember that we are never alone. We're in this context of a microbiome. And of course, as, as you just alluded at the end of your explanation, that of course, there is environmental microbiome as well, which, which very much uh, feeds into uh, the topic that we're discussing, the, the um, food production as well. So I wanted us to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about um, malnutrition. But before we do so, I want to engage the audience one more time. Um, and so if we can turn to the um, Slido again, you'll have the link to the question in the chat. Um, this time, very simple. What is one word that comes to your mind when you think about malnutrition? Just one word, if you can type that um, into the some really interesting responses, greed, waste, very interesting, uh, children, um, starvation, yeah. So waste is emerging as a, as a dominant theme, very interesting. Thank you, um, very interesting. And of course, um, my, my reason for engaging with this is um, that I now want to turn to, to our panelists and, and talk about um, what, what do we mean about malnutrition and in the same context, when we talk about um, combating the issue of malnutrition, of course, we talk about healthy and sustainable diet. Both of you alluded to this already. Um, and the fact that one size is unlikely to fit all can I ask you to comment on this? Um, how should we think about malnutrition? Um, and, and then what is the best path to, towards sustainable and healthy diet? Um, Lamise, can I turn to you first? Sure. As the nutritionist, I cannot but always start by saying that malnutrition comes in many forms. And not to complicate matters, but I did see that our audience are engaging with us and mentioning starvation and hunger, and that's a very important component of how we assess uh, malnutrition or inadequate diets. But there are, of course, other parameters that we look into. Uh, when we think about malnutrition, we think about both, and you alluded to that, Magdalena, we look at the undernutrition, be it from the underweight, the stunting, and the wasting that we unfortunately still see among children under five and that unfortunately the pandemic has exacerbated these rates we were doing fine but somehow around the 2013 2014 we started seeing that kind of going off track again on food insecurity on many of the other parameters of undernutrition in parallel to that the improvements that we were seeing uh, and the tapering off of the stunting, if you want, and the wasting was also uh, unfortunately in parallel with an increase in overweight and obesity, which is where we talk about the excessive uh, or overnutrition, excessive consumption of energy dense foods that are rich in and high in fat, in sugar, and in salt, which have been associated, of course, with higher uh, incidences and prevalence of non communicable diseases of all sorts, which are the leading causes of death in both high and low to middle income countries. Of course, in parallel to the infectious diseases that are affected by malnutrition. So when we think about malnutrition, we think about, again, the numbers. And if I want to just kind of portray these, and these are based on the state of food insecurity report that was published earlier this year. And I'm looking just to kind of give the exact numbers here and the weight of them. So when we talk about 22% of children under five that were found to be stunted. This is, we're talking, uh, translating to 149 million uh, in 2020 and at global level. Of course, these differ by continents and there are certain regions in Asia and Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa where the rates are unfortunately higher. When we look at wasting, which is too thin for height, we're looking at 45 million, so almost approaching 7% of the children under five. And we have 38.9 million children who are suffering from overweight and obesity also under five. 
an age group that we were for a long time as nutritionists worried about to reach to a point where we're having to fight the under and the overnutrition when we are at that time, unfortunately. In parallel to that, and to add more complexity to the matter, the adult obesity rates are quite high. The pediatric overweight and obesity, we're talking here about adolescents, we're talking about school age population, an age group that's very close and dear to my heart, and the research work that we've been doing is try to combat that. And whatever progress we've been doing, unfortunately, hasn't been catching up as much as the um, the challenges that we're facing or the shocks that we're facing. And if I also want to highlight something you've mentioned, it's very important and it's the talk of the town, as you say, it's when we talk about the solution and this transformation of the food system that we're calling for, it has to be with healthy and sustainable diets. Pre-pandemic, 3 billion people did not have access to healthy and nutritious food. And these numbers are were, were only further exacerbated with the pandemic. The system definitely needs to improve to be pro-people, to be more equitable, and to ensure that all people, rural, urban, higher, low middle income country residents, refugees, internally displaced, are capable and have access. So the definition of food security, access to all people at all times, the right to food. And this is something that have been published in many reports over the past couple of years. The high level panel of experts on food security and nutrition have been calling for that. They've put a lot of excellent um, food systems framework to in place. And the discussion today at the food summit is how can we translate these frameworks into actions, into actual solutions, then we can then test them and test those trade-offs that we talk about between environment, health, economics. How can this be translated into specific context solutions? That's where the challenge lies, and that's why there's a galvanized effort to talk about sustainability. If you want to stop this trend and improve it and meet the SDG goals, we cannot continue business as usual. This is definitely a pivotal time for us. Absolutely. V very good point. And indeed, even though increasingly we're talking about uh, food system, we're talking about interconnection of systems, we'll come back to this in, in a minute. As you just emphasized, we need to zoom in on specific solutions. So Jennifer, I wanted to turn to you. Um, what you're proposing, um, where you would like all of us collectively to, to focus our attention is one specific solution. So um, through microbiome, uh, focus on the microbiome, um, you can see a way forward towards um, a much more healthy diet, more um, productive uh, food system also. And there is of course another uh, important element that ties in with this uh, and that is uh, reducing um, antimicrobial uh, resistance. Can you tell us more about uh, that specific solution? Yeah, so it is one of the possible solutions. Um, much of the antibiotics we use in agriculture today goes towards improving um, productivity of farms, so making the animals get bigger, faster. And it also goes towards preventing disease in agriculture, so keeping them healthy so they can get bigger, faster. Um, this works because, you know, healthier animals grow faster. Um, so a, one way to remove some of the reliance on antibiotics for both productivity and for animal health is to actually make the animals healthy through modifying their microbiomes, through optimizing their microbiomes. And in the work we're doing, we're seeing that it might be possible. Um, there are specific microbiomes that do seem to resist infection. Um, thus reducing our reliance on antibiotics. Uh, in several of our trials, we've lost um, the antibiotics don't promote growth any better than our modified microbiome. So it's very encouraging. But beyond that, um, producing food with lower bacterial levels will also help um, waste. We, we lose a lot of food through wastage through outbreak recalls, and we lose a lot of food through spoilage. So making these more microbial with higher microbial integrity will actually reduce the food wastage in those perspectives as well. Really, really important points. And th this idea of microbiome engineering, so to speak, uh, modifying the microbiome in, in um, animals. And, and of course, we should also remember, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's also relevant in the context of aquatic food, not just 
terrestrial food, right? Um, and then, of course, there is um, quite a lot of awareness about looking after our own microbiomes, which, of course, contribute to our ability to digest, assimilate uh, food uh, appropriately. I wanted to um, turn, to, we, we touched on the issue of antimicrobial resistance, which is um, incredibly significant. Um, it has knock-on effects on, of course, uh, medical applications also. Um, I wanted to do a little, um, another little poll with our audience briefly um, to ask the question, um, uh, for again, your um, for for your voting, there will be a, a, a link in the in the chat. If you could cast your vote as to what the proportion of all antibiotics manufactured um, is used in the food sector, so you will uh, when you look at the um, possible poll, you will have a, a number of ranges. Well, with the exception of one, there's a 50 percent, the others are ranges. Um, please cast your vote. What is the proportion of all antibiotics manufactured um, that are used in the food sector? There you go. We have split votes. Um, yeah. Um, so essentially, most oh, now we have, we have a, a much more divided, much more divided vote. Although it is a complex picture, uh, Jennifer, I'm going to turn to you to to um, uh, tell us exactly, actually, what the proportion is. Yeah, it's a really hard thing to measure, and it's based on self-reporting in a lot of instances. But our best guess is that it's somewhere in the 70 to 80 percent range of all antibiotics manufactured are used for food production. I think this is such a powerful um, figure to remember. Most of us would, would not guess, even maybe around 50 percent, but not that the vast majority of antibiotics uh, produced are used in the context of of food production. Uh, thank you for that. For that. Um, I wanted to come back to the issue of the food system. Um, we um, increasingly talk about um, the, the importance of food production as a system. We touched on this a couple of times already. Can I ask you to elaborate a little more why it is so important that we talk about the system, uh, the food production as a system? Um, Lamis, you talked about trade-offs at the very beginning when in your first um, set of statements. Could you maybe pick up that topic first? Sure. Um, I think I want to just also take a step back and, and define how we see food systems. You've mentioned something very important, which is food production being an integral component of it within the food supply. However, the food system is definitely more complex. And within the food supply chain, we're talking about food production. We're talking about food processing, distribution, then talking about a very important component, which is the food environment, where people are accessing the food, what kind of labeling is going on what kind of promotional uh, work or campaigns have been access to the supermarkets, distance from the supermarket, economic uh, access to the food, if we have access to healthy and nutritious food. So when we think about food systems, there is the food supply, there's the food environment, and of course, something that is uh, very important in our work, which is the consumer behavior, what the what the consumers are deciding to consume. So not just what we are you know, uh, pro providing or producing, but rather the consumer, uh, consumer's own decisions that really push the supply demand whole conversation. And the demand has been in more healthy and sustainable diets, which is why a lot of the uh, private industry and a lot of the corp big corporations have been tackling issues from the production to the processing and distribution to tackle many of the issues that we face. You've mentioned, and my colleague Jennifer mentioned, food waste, and that's like one third, thirty percent of the, uh, you know, of the of the food of the world is being lost, lost in the, uh, you know, post harvest losses, or even making it all through the food system to the consumer choices and then to the food waste at that level. And of course, there's specific definitions for food loss and food waste, not to go into the depth of it. But I just wanted to make sure that when we think about it, that 
system is complex by itself. So then when we talk about healthy and sustainable diets, the decisions when we call when we call agriculture should be more nutrition sensitive or the interventions and programs should be more nutrition sensitive, it doesn't start at the environment. It does start from the beginning of how we produce the food and whether the food we produce is safe. It's enough to ensure the rural livelihoods and the uh, economic uh, productivity of the farmers or of the fisheries and so on and so forth. But it also ensures that we can do this sustainably so they can continue Continue to produce food to, to feed healthy and nutritious food. So that's an important thing to talk about. Also, another thing I've been mentioning, and I really also want to make sure that that's clear, the sustainable diet term that we are using, and, and, and that is where the trade-offs come in. So to answer your question here, the trade-offs that I talked about are the trade-offs that are embedded within when we say a sustainable diet. It's a diet that takes nutrition and health on one side of the equation, and they are the dietary patterns that should promote healthy, healthy bodies, healthy being, productive, and all of the good stuff. Excuse me. In addition to that, you should take into consideration all the other factors that affect sustainability, which are the environmental parameters, which include, for example, our carbon footprint or the greenhouse gas emissions, the water footprint, the energy, and so on and so forth. So these are the trade-offs that we talk about. And in the field of our research and many other researchers, of course, but I, I have to mention that uh, in my institution at AUB, we've been looking at this water, energy, food, health nexus uh, from the former Dean Rabia to our colleagues, Dr. Hwalla, and many others on, uh, on the teams that I work with, we've been providing models of what a sustainable diet means. And we've been providing them using linear modeling techniques to take into consideration those trade-offs. We're providing some scenarios of what could be a sustainable diet or sustainable food-based dietary guidelines for specific age groups. And there are those examples that I'm happy to elaborate on. I just wanted to make sure that when we talk about those, that it's clear that also we're pushing for trade-offs across the food system so that we can ensure that we are really doing things sustainably and not just promoting healthy diets, but not necessarily taking into consideration whether we can continue to do that for the future generations. Over to you, Daniela. Absolutely. Very, very, very important point. And I wanted to bring in Jennifer here because in this very broad umbrella discussion that, that we're now having, rightly so, um, almost at every point on this discussion, I can see a role of, for example, fundamental research into the nature of the microbiome and how, how can that be um, um, engineered or, 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 or tinkered with. Um, Jennifer, would you like to come in and make a comment on that, how that synergy uh, can be, should be remembered and brought out? Yeah, and I, I think that really plays in to the systems approach we've been talking about. Um, we're not separate from what happens on farms, and farms are not separate from what happens in our societies. Um, when we're looking at this, I think it's really important to remember how bad the microbiome or the um, antibiotic resistance crisis is going to get. The current projections are that 10 million people a year are going to die by 2050 of resistant infections, which is a huge number. So every time we try to up production on the farms by using antibiotics, we're contributing to this crisis because these genes don't stay on our farms. They move into our farmers, whose health I'm very concerned about, and then they move into our communities when we see them in the hospitals. So this whole idea of coming up with ways to cut this chain so we don't see the consequences in our clinics and in our farmers and in our communities is something we really have to think about because we don't fully understand food systems at this level and how what we do on our farms affects us and why. Um, so it's an important part to look at the basic science of that and try to understand it so we can intervene. Absolutely. So thank you for, for that reminder. And so, you know, we see how the, the food, the environment, the food with its many aspects, the environment, health, how they're all interconnected. And yet, you know, this year we have the, well, today starting UN Food Systems Summit, later in the year we'll have the Climate COP, and then of course in the spring of next year the, the Biodiversity Summit in, in Kunming. Very briefly, because unfortunately we're coming to the end of our time, isn't there a missed opportunity that we compartmentalizing these events in, in this way? What, what, what do you think? Should we not have, make a greater effort to bring them together? 
Jennifer, do you want to jump in on that? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, sure. Yeah. I mean, all of these are going to clash eventually. Like climate is driving emergence of disease, which is driving emergence of more interventions on farms. Um, Like we have to talk about these as the interconnected issues that they are. We can't be separate. Um, And we have to do that for the basic research perspective as well, because all of these things are going to come crashing into each other. Absolutely. Lamise, final word on that? I just want to say that earlier today, there was an excellent talk about breaking silos for food and climate security. And I think that I just kind of taking up from that concept, the FAO director, WFP director, and many other of the attendees were really promoting the idea that we should break the silos. And that goes back to your question. Um, I'm, I'm going to look at it from a positive angle that we do have several summits and events that are galvanizing, again, the efforts and bringing stakeholders from all across you know, uh, sectors to talk about such complex systems that, uh, that come into play. So I think from that angle, it's good. But breaking silos is very important. I don't think we can continue uh, business as usual. I think we are, uh, the, the house is on fire. The, the world is on fire as the video started. We cannot sit there and, and watch and think maybe in 10 years how we can act. I think we all feel the pressure, especially with the climate change and the crises that are happening, um, not to mention the pandemic, the ongoing protracted conflicts and wars. They're all triggering this economic recessions, which triggers more wars and, and more climate disasters. So it's, it's about time that we work together. Thank you very much for your powerful words, both of you and your suggestions. Um, We don't have time to repeat the last question of of the the Slido poll, but those of you who are listening, um, I think you will now probably appreciate that there are many reasons, uh, you will agree that there are many reasons uh, for which to um, change your diet and uh, think about food from a sustainable, but also a holistic interconnected perspective. Um, Thank you, Lamise. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you for all of you for joining our session. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.